So last time we talked about why current actually flows in circuits. Um, and we found that uh, we deduced that, that uh, in order to make the electric field that we need in a circuit to keep current flowing in a steady state, that there must be various sources of charge that make that electric field. Some of it's on the battery, but some of it is actually charge that builds up along the surface of the wire during a transient where things are getting to the steady state. Um, and so in our the complicated sort of snaky circuit we looked at last time, we found that uh, we used this mechanical battery that was a little easier to understand than a chemical one that we, we also saw that it's the gradient of surface charge, so the, the, the spatial rate of spatial variation of the surface charge, not the amount of charge that makes a field. So that, um, that we would have a lot of positive charge here near the battery, and less here, and less here, and maybe none here, and a little bit of negative, and whatnot. So there's a variation in surface charge around the circuit, and that contributes to the electric field uh, that that drives the current in a circuit. Um, possibly the the most important thing we saw, though we didn't say it this way last time, is that uh, in a circuit, what you can't just look at one part of a circuit and figure out what's happening. Okay, all parts of the circuit affect all other parts of the circuit. If charge builds up here, it may contributes to this field here. Uh, and so when we analyze circuits, we have to do a, a global kind of analysis. We have to look at the circuit as a whole and not just one part of the circuit, not just the battery or not just the light bulb or not just the, the, the wire, um, but everything all at once. So it's a kind of, to think about the steady state, we're going to engage in a kind of constraint-based reasoning. Today we're going to get a little more quantitative. We're going to, we're going to talk about how to analyze circuits um, and how to predict currents in circuits and through different circuit elements. And to do this, uh, we're basically at, at, at uh, we're going to be really just using basic ideas. One is something that we know uh, and have known for a long time that the, if you measure the potential differences around some path that comes back and gets to the same point again, you make a round trip path, the potential difference between where you started and where you ended has to end up being zero. And that's basically conservation of energy at work, because if that weren't the case, we saw that uh, that would mean that some particle could travel along here, gaining energy, gaining energy, gaining energy, gaining energy all the way, and have more energy when it got back to where it started, with no energy inputs, because these fields are made by charges that are just fixed in position. <clears throat> so this is basically a form of energy conservation, but on a, a per charge basis. And the other thing we talked about that has to be true in a circuit at the steady state is that um, if we pick any location in a circuit, which we call a node, that the number of electrons per second flowing into it has to equal <coughs> the number of electrons per second flowing out of it in the steady state. Because if it doesn't, charge is building up and we're not in the steady state. That's going to mean currents are changing. So by definition of the steady state and by conservation of charge, we can't just destroy those charges. Um, that has to be true. These have names. This is called the, the current <coughs>
current node rule just says current going into a node has to equal current coming out of a node. Um, and this is, this is really a, fun, a very fundamental thing, but it's called, it's often called the loop rule because you're making, a, you're measuring potential difference around a complete loop. Um, and notice that uh, this kind of equation relates current in, in, in two different parts of a circuit. So, so if, we, if we establish a node, say here, we know that the, the number of electrons per second flowing toward that point has to be equal to the number of electrons per second flowing away from that point or else we're going to get electrons building up there and then changing the fields and then we're not in a steady state. So at the steady state that has to be true. So we're looking at relating two different parts of a circuit here and this, th the round trip potential difference uh, takes into account everything in the circuit. So, um, so what we're going to do today is see how to use to write, to apply these ideas to particular circuits. Um, and write out these equations in a way that will actually let us calculate things about the circuits, predict things about the circuits. So that's where we're going today. <coughs> um, so, So if we, if we apply this to a circuit, uh, so here's a simple circuit. It consists of a battery and a wire that is not necessarily a very good conductor. Um, in the, the electricity kits that we work with in lab, there are, uh, they're probably no longer wrapped around the compass boxes, but there's a couple of wires that are shiny and not, don't have insulation on them. They're made of what's, they're called nichrome. It's a, it's a mixture of nickel and chromium. Um, conductors. They're conductors, but they're not as good conductors as the clip leads. And so we can use these uh, if we want to get a bigger electric field in something because we need to get a current, you need a bigger electric field to make current. And they have two different cross-sectional areas, which also turns out to be useful. You can just touch them and feel that one is thick and one is thin. Um, so that's, that's going to be useful too. Um, so let's say this is a nichrome wire. <coughs> and <coughs> so it's got some, some length L. <coughs> um, if we wanted to write an equation describing the, the round trip potential difference starting from some location, let's start here at the negative end of the battery. We'll call this location A. <coughs> and since we have to pick a path, we'll pick a path um, that goes, let's pick a clockwise path. So our path is going to start here. It's going to go across the battery. And then it's going to continue through the wire and come back to where we started, going clockwise. <coughs> and so we can, and one of the things about that's sort of helpful about our analysis of circuits is that in most, case, most cases um, the electric field isn't varying continuously. Within a region the electric field is, is uniform. So in the wire the electric field is uniform because it's got a uniform cross-section made of a uniform uh, composition. And so, uh, so we can write so, so that's helpful because then delta V is often just a minus E times L um, in these calculations. 
So if we write a loop equation for this, we, we want, we'd get the potential difference across the battery plus the potential difference there <coughs> equals zero. <coughs> um, now, since this is the positive end of the battery, this is the negative end of the battery, uh, we know that everywhere in the wire there has to be an electric field E that's, that's following the wire. How does it follow the wire? Well, charges are building up on the surface of the wire in such a way to contribute to the field to make the field follow the wire. And so we've got this electric field E throughout the wire. So this piece is just going to be um, this everywhere the electric field is going to be parallel to our path. So the potential is decreasing. So that's just going to be a minus E, whatever E is in the wire, times the length of the wire. <coughs> but what's the potential difference across a battery? Um, if there's a potential difference across the battery, it suggests that there has to be an electric field in the battery. <coughs> and in fact, <coughs> what, what does the direction of the electric field in this battery have, inside the battery have to be? Yeah, it's going to point from the, the positive end to the negative end inside the battery. And it's got to be big compared to the field in the wire because it, the battery is shorter than the wire, right? <coughs> so, <coughs> so what is this electric field in a battery? Um, well, <coughs> let's, um, <coughs> let's think about this mechanical battery analog we use to, to talk about our, our circuit here. So we said a battery is kind of like a capacitor. Um, so we've got, uh, in this battery here, we've got positive charges on this side. We've got negative charges on this side. And in order to, so what a battery does is maintain this charge separation. Um, but in order to do that, some energy has to be expended because not if it's just sitting there but if we connect it to a circuit electrons are going to flow out that way and this charge would decrease unless we built up more charge on it so in our mechanical battery which works like a Van de Graaff generator we have a little conveyor belt um, here with uh, with a crank that we turn in this case. So here's our crank. Um, and what it does is actually pull electrons off this positive plate and transport them over here to go onto the negative plate. Now they of course don't want to do that, right? Because there's some electric field inside here pointing that way and so there's a, a force on the electron Uh, whose magnitude is the charge on the electron times E in the battery. And so we have to exert an equal and opposite force to get them to move across. So we need some force here. And because this is a force that's not made by the charges on the battery, uh, it's something else, it's often called a a non-coulomb or a non-charge force. So, <clears throat> a force that's that's due to the conveyor belt or something. We're being very non-specific here, but that's that's what it's called. <clears throat> um, Okay, so this, this force, this, this non-coulomb force on the, 
to make the electron go over here has to be equal in magnitude to the charge on the battery times the electric field in the battery. <coughs> um, and so therefore, um, the potential difference across the battery, uh, well, we're getting ahead of ourselves a little bit. So the amount of work to transport a charge from there to there is just going to be that force times the separation of these two plates, which is, we'll call S, because we're kind of modeling it as a capacitor, right? <coughs> and um, <coughs> this is just <coughs> the electric field, the charge times the electric field in the battery times S. <coughs> And so, since pot um, <coughs> since work uh, done the internal to the system here is is Q delta V, this is going to be E times the potential difference across the battery, which is just this electric field times S. <coughs> Now, there's, um, this is, this is basically an energy input per coulomb. Or that's, that's an energy input for one charge. If we want an energy input for per coulomb, <coughs> we just have, uh, It's just the potential difference across the battery. But this, <coughs> this force is a completely different force from the force exerted on the, on the, on the electrons by the battery. Um, and so <coughs> this thing, um, the non-Coulomb force times S divided by the charge actually has a name. It's called the EMF of the battery. And in this battery, it was done by a, turning a crank and moving electrons. In a, in a chemical battery, it's done by chemical reactions, right? So there's some things that aren't charge forces that make electrons pop off one molecule and onto another. And <coughs> This is numerically equal to the, the potential difference across the battery, but it's, it's a different thing. Okay, it's sort of the work per unit charge that, the, that the, uh, the, a particular battery can produce. Now, you measured potential differences across batteries in lab, right? And you got something on the order of one and a half volts, probably not exactly one and a half volts because an alkaline battery is more like 1.6 volts, really. Um, and that's the that's equal to the EMF of these batteries. What does EMF stand for? Um, don't. Yeah, it, it stands for this really archaic term that doesn't make any sense. It it stood for this thing called electromotive force. Well, it's not a force. It doesn't have units of force. It has units of potential, of volts. <coughs> so we're just going to call it EMF. Um, it's one of these. One of these terms from the, the distant past that, that's hung around. <coughs> um, so, so what is a battery? Well, a battery expends energy to maintain a constant potential difference across itself, maintain charge. So, <coughs> so uh, 
maintain a charge separation. Now, can it always do it? Well, an ideal battery can always do that, but a real battery can't always keep up. So if you hooked up a circuit that allowed such a, a huge current to flow, lots and lots of electrons per second leaving this negative plate, a real battery just couldn't keep up. And the potential difference would start to drop. But in circuits that don't do that, to, to a pretty good approximation, a battery is, is maintaining a constant potential difference across itself and a constant charge separation. <clears throat> All of which goes to say that what we can do here is we can write the EMF of the battery, which is equal in magnitude to the potential difference across the battery here in this equation, <clears throat> is plus the electric field on the wire times the length of the wire is zero. <clears throat> well, we could, now we actually have an equation. We don't really have any nodes here because this is a super simple circuit. But we could have for the electric field in the wire. <clears throat> so we can just solve for E wire is equal to the EMF of the battery divided by the length of the wire. But that's only true in this circuit. So if we had um, two different kinds of wire, for example, then it would get a little more complicated. <coughs> um, so let's think about uh, Okay, before we actually before we actually start doing analyses, let's just think about writing um, writing loop equations for a minute, writing these round trip potential difference equations. So let's consider a couple of other different circuits. So here's a circuit that has um, A thick wire, so a thick nichrome wire and then a thin nichrome wire. <coughs> Another thick nichrome wire. Okay, so this is this is length L1 <coughs> and it has area cross-sectional area A1, L1, A1, and this has a length L2 and a cross-sectional area A2. <coughs> So to write a loop equation, a, a round trip potential difference equation, and here's a battery which has some EMF. Maybe it's one and a half volts, maybe it's a nine volt battery. We don't know what it is. Um, so delta V round trip. Um, so this is the, the end of the battery with the, the bump on it is the positive end and the other end's the negative end. <clears throat> so if we take, so our round trip is going to have to go through uh, all of these, the battery and all these pieces of wire. So if we start again at this end, we're going to go this way, that way, back to there. <clears throat> now why does, why does our path have to go through the wires? <clears throat> I mean, would it be valid to draw a round trip path that did that? <clears throat> sure, but it doesn't give us any information. <laughs> well, we, we're gonna end up wanting to know the field in the wires to calculate the current, right? And so we need this path to go through the wires so that we can do that. <clears throat> so, this round trip path, we'd have a potential difference across the battery that's uh, positive because we're going against the field inside the battery and it's numerically equal to the EMF of the battery. 
<coughs> and now we've got a minus L, the electric field in wire one times the length of wire one. <coughs> and now we get to wire two, E2, L2. And over here, we're back to something with length L1 again, and the same, so we have another E1, L1 now. Now really, <coughs> um, so really I'm actually making a leap here. So let's call this, uh, let's call this E3. So can we solve that equation and get the electric fields? Uh, if we know the lengths, can we solve that equation to get all those electric fields? So what's, what are knowns and what are unknowns in this equation? We know the lengths. We know the EMF of the battery. It looks like we've got one, two, three unknowns and only one equation. So that isn't going to help. <coughs> Kendra? What's the What? What's the electric Because this is the negative end of the battery. And obviously the field, <coughs> the field here is pointing away <coughs> from the positive end of the battery. And then we know that surface charge arranges, so um, so that the electric field follows the wire. And here we're going to have electrons moving away from this, so the electric field must be pointing there. So, okay, just just from the way we drew the battery. <coughs> The inside of the battery, the field's a very different thing. It has to be pointing that way, doesn't it? <coughs> but that's, that's like a, a capacitor, right? So we've got, if we have, I, let's do it the other way. <coughs> okay, in here, the electric field surely points that way. But out here, we saw that the electric field, due to these plates, pointed that way. So the battery looks a lot like a, a capacitor, right? <coughs> so we don't have enough. We, we have three electric fields, and we don't have enough information to, to solve this equation. Yeah? Well, E1 and E3, are they the same? That's pretty interesting. So let's see if we can prove that they're the same. <coughs> so what can we do to, um, so can we write some node equations? <coughs> so what should we pick as a node? <coughs> we could write, we, so we could write an equation for the current through the battery. But if we're interested in relating these electric fields to each other, maybe we should pick a junction between two different parts of the conductor. So let's pick this as a node, okay? <coughs> so we'll say that the current in this wire is, wire is I3, okay? So let's write a node equation for here. <coughs> So the current into this node, the number of electrons per second is I1, <coughs> and the current out of that node is I2, and in the steady state they have to be equal, right? Well, that doesn't help. It doesn't have electric fields in it. Or does it? <coughs> there are electric fields hiding in this equation because, remember that, the electron current is the 
mobile electron density times the cross-sectional area times the mobility times the electric field, NAV. So therefore, this is an, and everything's here made of the same materials. So we have an N, A1, <coughs> U, E1 equals N, A2, U, E2. <coughs> That doesn't help us prove that E1 equals E3, but can we write another note equation? Okay, so we have this node, which says that I3 equals I2. So we have an N A1 U E3 is an N A2 U E2, which we also know is equal to and A1, U, E1. So now we know that this, this current and that current are the same. And in these equations, the ends are the same because the material is the same, the U's are the same. And now we have the same cross-sectional area, so we just proved that, that E1, E3, <coughs> equals E1. So that's helpful. We can rewrite this equation as an E1 L1. But we still have two unknowns now. Uh, what? You could choose as a node the Yeah, we could actually. So you could you could just say the current going into this thin wire equals the current going out of that thin wire. We don't often do that, but it is a legal thing to do. <coughs> Would have simplified our life. This was a long way to prove something you actually probably saw. But <coughs> okay, so now we've got an equation here with two unknowns. That's better. But do we have enough information to resolve that? We actually do, don't we? Because this node equation <coughs> helps us. So we can write uh, E1, so all the N's and U's are the same. So we have an E1 is in A2 over A1 E2. <coughs> and now we have the EMF minus an E1 L1 minus and uh, oh we have we better write this okay maybe it would have been simpler to do the other way huh let's do it the other way <coughs> so we have E1 times A1 over A2 is E2 so we have a minus E1 L1 minus <coughs> E2 L2, which becomes an A1 over A2 E1. Uh, E1 L1 is zero. And finally, we have enough information. Now we've got an equation that one unknown, and we can we can solve it, right? So, and once we know the electric field in a wire, we can actually calculate the current in that wire because if we know mobile electron density and the cross-sectional area and the mobility, then we can multiply by the electric field and get the current. So that's, that's basically the scheme. And we use these two equations in some combination. In some of them, you might need more than one node equation or more than one loop equation to, to solve problems. And that's part of what we'll be doing in recitation is actually solving some actual problems <coughs> using this. Um, So this loop rule applies, this idea applies to any circuit. 
<laughs> so do you, what questions do you have about what we did here before you, <laughs> before we go on? Okay. Um, so we could have light bulbs, we could have, um, we could have different kinds of light bulbs, we could even have capacitors in a circuit and we'll do that a little bit in lab. Um, and uh, So we can actually um, draw some conclusions about different circuits. So for example, let's consider the following circuit. Now, so we could have circuits like, like this where we've got um, a light bulb connected to some wires. Um, now you actually measured potential differences around a circuit like this in the lab. It was a couple weeks ago, right? So what did you, what do you remember about, so the battery was, I don't know if you had one battery, the battery was about one and a half volts. What was, do you remember what the potential difference across the light bulb was compared to the battery? Okay, how big, a, how big an electric, so these are really thick conducting wires here. Mm -hmm. So how big an electric field do you think we need in these big thick conducting wires to make a, a light bulb glow? <coughs> Let's see here, if we can do this. <coughs> okay, so here's, I'm using two batteries in this circuit, but here's, We have two different kinds of light bulbs uh, in these kits. One, the round one has a thick filament and the, the long bulb, which looks sort of more elongate, that's, yeah, that's a long bulb. It's got a thinner filament, um, so it's not as bright. But, let's see here, we can, Okay, so we've got a, a meter here. So let's measure some potential differences. I want to measure volts. I want to measure DC volts. Okay, so the potential difference across one battery is Point one volts, really? This one's one point three. These are very old batteries, I think. Okay, so let's say it's about uh, so the potential difference I'm getting across the light bulb is something like it's hard to hold it here, and it would be much better if I had better clips, but about 2.3 volts. And that's actually the sum of the potential differences I was getting across the batteries. So the potential difference across a wire in this circuit is about, it's a few millivolts. I think I'm getting about 20 millivolts here. So, so, the, elect so the, the wires, the electric field in the wires is actually much smaller than the electric field in this light bulb, which makes sense. You've got to get all these electrons through this narrow filament. So, they, 
So one of the approximations we often make in analyzing a circuit like this, if we wrote <coughs> delta V round trip correctly, it'd be the EMF of the battery minus E wire, L wire, minus E bulb times the length of the filament minus <coughs> is zero. And we say these are small enough that we neglect them as long as we're, we know we're using really thick conducting wires which makes this, this analysis simple. <coughs> um, so let's think about the following situation. <coughs> Suppose we have <coughs> a battery connected to one of our chrome wires. <coughs> so here's our battery. We're going to use some long, some of these clip leads, which are very good conductors, to connect to a piece of nichrome wire of length L. And so we can write a loop equation which says that the EMF of the battery, our loop is going to go this way, and we're not using the whole wire, okay, just <coughs> minus, well, we're going to neglect these conducting wires because they're really good conductors. We're just going to focus on this nichrome wire, which is not a good conductor. <coughs> so minus E, uh, we'll call this E1 for circuit 1, L is 0, and so the electric field in this wire is just going to be the EMF of L. <coughs> and so the current <coughs> is <coughs> the mobile electron density times the cross-sectional area times the mobility times the electric field in this wire. <coughs> now let's make a different circuit where <coughs> we <coughs> double the length of the conductor. So we're going <coughs> to, okay? Are we going to get the same current in this circuit? How is the current in this circuit going to relate to the one we did previously? So this is, <coughs> this is a battery. So we double the length of the nichrome wire in the circuit. What's going to happen to the current? Same battery, right? So should we get the same current? Let's work it out. <coughs> now we have EMF minus, we'll call this E2 for circuit 2, times 2L <coughs> is 0. <coughs> So E2 is going to be equal to the EMF of the battery over 2L. <coughs> and our current is going to be equal to NAU <coughs> E2. And how is E2 related to E1? Yeah, it's half as big, isn't it? So that's a half of I1. <coughs> so we double the length of the conductor. <coughs> the electric field in this wire went down by a factor of two, and so the current <coughs> went down. So message, the same battery doesn't always produce the same current. It depends on the whole circuit. Okay, which is one of the things I meant about this sort of global constraint analysis. <coughs> um, so we can kind of do this with a circuit here. Uh, and it'll, it's 
it's interesting to try. So here's our <coughs> here's our light bulb, and it's it's a round bulb, and it's it's reasonably bright. I don't know if you guys in the back row can see it, but it's pretty bright. <coughs> So how can we double the length of a filament of a light bulb? Well, we can't get in there and double the length of a filament of a light bulb, but we could add another light bulb whose filament is probably the same length. <coughs> and so let's do that. So we'll just make put two light bulbs in our circuit. And now we see that they're lit, but they're not very bright. <coughs> and is current, is brightness proportional to current? Yeah, because the number of electrons colliding with the metal lattice that make the atoms vibrate per second is, is smaller. So we clearly have a smaller current here. And we could actually, these meters will measure currents as well. They won't measure electrons per second, they'll measure amperes, which is coulombs per second, but if you divide by the charge on an electron, you get electrons per second. So that sort of bears out our, our prediction. Now, if you do it with light bulbs, you'll find an interesting thing. If you do it with a nichrome wire, you should actually get that result. If you do it with light bulbs, you won't find that the current is exactly half what it was before. Because it turns out that um, the idea that mobility is a property of the material is a little bit of a, of a wrong assumption. Bec it, it is a property of the material, but it also depends on temperature. So the more the lattice, the hotter the material is, the more the atoms in the lattice are vibrating, the lower the mobility is. <coughs> so, uh, so, that, so, so it isn't going to quite work out perfectly, but it's, it's reasonably good. Um, okay. I want to mention one other kind of a circuit, which is called, so, so the circuits we built here, uh, the, so we built this circuit and then we built this circuit where we had two light bulbs <coughs> connected to each other. So our loop goes through both of them. That's, that's called a series circuit because the light bulbs are <coughs> in series with each other. <coughs> There's another possible way to connect them <coughs> Uh, so we could use some extra wires and do that. And that's called a parallel circuit because the light bulbs are not, there's no loop you can, when you go from the battery back to the battery, you only go through one of the light bulbs, so they're, they're in parallel. <coughs> Um, now we will actually work a problem like this in recitation. So how would we write loop and node equations for, for a circuit like this, for a parallel circuit? So We'll call these bulbs one and two. <coughs> Actually, <coughs> let's call this wire one and that two and that three just to make our lives simpler. <coughs> so what's a What's a round trip loop we could take through this circuit? So we could we could start at the battery. 
go this way. Now what happens? Got to pick one, don't we? Okay, so they want to take the bottom one, we'll go through the bottom one. And then the rule about a round trip loop is it can't it can't close on its it it has to be a a single closed curve. It can't have squiggles in the middle. <coughs> so so we've gotten back here and we've only gone through one of the bulbs. So we have uh, the EMF of the battery minus, we're going to neglect the wires, right? So <coughs> E3 times the length of the bulb filament equals zero, right? Is there another loop equation we could write? Okay, so we could take this other path that goes through two, so we could write EMF minus E2, let's assume their filaments are the same length. So what has to be true about the electric fields in these two bulbs here? They're equal if they're filaments, yes. So E, E2 um, Okay, so what does that imply about the if these bulbs are identical like same cross-sectional area and whatnot then what does it imply about the currents? They'd have to be the same, wouldn't they? <coughs> So what about the current here? Going through this wire though. Relate to the current through these bulbs. It's the sum, isn't it? So we need that node equation. We need I1 is I2 plus I3. So <coughs> Okay, so now here's the question. How does the current through bulb two in this parallel circuit compare to the current through the same bulb in this circuit? <coughs> so this is, this is our bulb two. <coughs> so how do we reframe this question in terms of these quantities we're we're looking at here. Okay, so let's write <coughs> so <coughs> so this is the parallel. <coughs> the single bulb circuit We have EMF plus minus E2L equals zero. So E2 is equal to the EMF of the battery over L. <coughs> Here we have E2 is the EMF of the battery over L. <coughs> So it looks like the current through this bulb doesn't change from when it's by itself to when it's in this parallel circuit with another identical light bulb. So what happens to the current coming out of the battery in this case? Yeah, that's right. So, so in this case, we have current I2 here. We've got current I2 and another current I2, so we have a 2 I2 here, so the battery has to maintain twice as much current in this parallel circuit. <coughs> it's 
So we can do a lot of proportional reasoning, or we can actually calculate numbers if we have all the, all the details here. Oh, I actually, that's all right, I'll just get it from the quiz, never mind, yes? So what happens if you line up like a ton of light bulbs to the point where the battery can't mm -hmm. without that? In, in what situation? So the question is, what happens when you line up uh, a 20 light bulbs or 100 light bulbs or whatever? <coughs> oh, in this situation? So we put 100 light bulbs in parallel? Well, eventually the battery can't do it. <coughs> so the potential, it we talked about at the beginning of class. And so the amount of charge on the battery starts to drop and the current in the whole circuit starts to drop. <coughs> Well, why don't we just, instead of putting a billion light bulbs in parallel, why don't we just put a wire, a really thick wire, <laughs> around yeah, the thing that carries a lot of... Yeah, so you put a billion light bulbs in parallel. <coughs> uh, okay, so at that point, what happens with a real battery is that it turns out that the battery... Um, The, the, what, what dominates, and we'll have a quantitative way of talking about this in the next chapter, but what dominates in a real battery is actually uh, how hard it is to turn the crank in our mechanical battery, it just gets impossible, or how hard, how, how fast charges can diffuse through the goo inside the battery in a, in a chemical battery. So that's kind of the limiting step. And charges can't diffuse through the goo infinitely fast and so, in fact, that's, that becomes the thing that de dominates the behavior of the circuit. It's called internal resistance, and we'll see how we can model that simply uh, next week. <coughs> so other questions about this, this idea here? <coughs> Um, okay, so what we're going to do is practice this kind of analysis in recitation. Mm.